100 years ago, an extraordinary man passed away in the Holy Land at the age of 77. He had spent more than half a century as a prisoner and an exile. But on his release, and despite his advanced age, his health impaired by decades of imprisonment, he set off on a journey to spread a message of peace, unity, and hope to the world. His name was Abdul Baha. I could see the radiance of this man who was to make such an impression on all our lives. You see such power latent within that person. I never in all my life heard a voice like that. It was vibrant and ringing. I'm Rain Wilson. And I'm Parisa Fitzhenley. And in this series of podcasts, we'll be finding out about this unique figure in human history, celebrating his life and legacy and the enduring influence he has had on people around the world ever since. When he left the house, the sun disappeared, but that kind of sunshine never leaves one's heart. Through his public talks, his writings, his love and service to all who crossed his path, Abdul Baha offered a pattern of right living to all people for all time. He was, in every sense of the word, an ambassador to humanity. New York City, Monday the 15th of April, 1912. Hudson Maxim stands in a reception room in the Hotel Ansonia. He has a meeting with the man the newspapers are calling the Prophet of Peace. But Maxim is in the business of war. His brother invented the machine gun in 1883. His nephew, three years ago, patented a silencer for weapons. And he himself has just earned his fame for creating smokeless gunpowder. Maxim boasts that generals can now kill the enemy without choking their own men. The New York Times reports, he has made enough high explosive to blow all the navies in the world out of the water. Peace would certainly not be very good for business, and Maxim intends to make his case to Abdul Baha, whose message of universal brotherhood and world unity has taken the country by storm. Do you consider war necessary? Hudson asks Abdul Baha. Abdul Baha looks at his guest and asks him back, why not try peace for a while? Hudson makes no reply. Abdul Baha continues, if we find war is better, it will not be difficult to fight again. But if we find that peace is the glorification of humanity, the impulse of true civilization, the stimulus to inventive genius, and the means of attainment to the good pleasure of God, we must agree to adhere to it and establish it permanently. Maxim decides to try a different approach to convince Abdul Baha that war isn't as bad as it used to be. Fewer are killed in modern engagements than in the battles of ancient times. The range is longer and the action less deadly, he says. He takes out a pen and paper and starts to draw. The effect of a bomb, he explains, is not so great as expected. Most of its force is expended upward into the air. He tells Abdul Baha that war is part of human nature that can never be eradicated, that conflict is a natural and healthy part of social evolution, that the deadlier they make the weapon, the less likely it will be used, and that war is no more dangerous than driving automobiles. After listening to Hudson's arguments for some time, Abdul Baha allows him to finish and then turns the conversation to the subject of Maxim himself. You are a celebrated inventor and scientific expert whose energies and faculties are employed in the production of means for human destruction, he says. Now you have the opportunity of becoming doubly famous. You must practice the science of peace. You must discover the means of peace. Invent guns of love which will shake the foundations of humanity. Then will it be said by the people of the world this is Mr. Maxim, inventor of the guns of war, discoverer of high explosives, military scientist, who has also discovered and invented means for increasing the life and love of man, who has put an end to the strife of nations and uprooted the tree of war. 
Then will your life become pregnant and productive with really great results. God will be pleased with you, and from every standpoint of estimation, you will be a perfect man. Today, there are thousands of peace organizations, and wars rage on within countries and across borders. Peace continues to elude the human race. But what might we learn from Abdul Baha's approach? When Abdul Baha embarks on his travels to Europe and North America in 1911, the West is experiencing a period of great prosperity. There has been no war on European soil for almost four decades and nearly half a century has passed since the disastrous American Civil War. Every year, new technological and industrial advances are being proudly displayed at international expositions. Experts are heralding the recent establishment of the International Court of Arbitration as the end of bloodshed. Hundreds of arbitration agreements have been signed, including between Great Britain and Germany in 1904. Plans are underway to unveil a peace palace in The Hague in 1913. Historian Amin Eheya. To begin with, all those believed that in order to achieve peace, it was enough to have a proper international law and a proper international model of governance. So most of the participants at these conferences believe by establishing a proper policy of international arbitration, peace would be soon achieved. At the time that Abdul Baha visited, there was already an international arbitration tribunal based in The Hague in the Netherlands. And from 1899, some world powers started to sign arbitral treaties with different countries. For instance, by 1912, when Abdul Baha was visiting the United States, the country had signed more than 25 bilateral treaties of arbitration. So everybody at that time hoped that by increasing these kind of treaties and by having more countries under the umbrella of this international arbitration tribunal in The Hague, peace would be a reality soon. So it's commonly thought that for the establishment of peace, all that is needed is the right kind of international court, a well-formulated international treaty, the right sort of economic arrangements, or the right kind of conference. In short, the path to peace is a strictly materialist exercise. So how does what Abdul Baha says differ? Who does he choose to speak to? And where does he deliver his message? In the summer of 1911, Albert Smiley, a Quaker and founder of the renowned Lake Mohunk Conferences on International Arbitration, receives a letter from Egypt. The letter is dated 9 August and signed by Abdul Baha, the head of a new global religion. Abdul Baha praises the gathering as the greatest result of the age and describes how his father, Baha'u'llah, has called for the unity of all nations and religions. Impressed, Albert Smiley consults his twin brother and co-founder of the conference, and together they decide to invite Abdu'l-Bahá to give the opening lecture at the 1912 gathering. With so many groups holding meetings to promote peace, why has Abdu'l-Bahá chosen Lake Mohonk? Author Kathy Hoganson. He singled out the Lake Mohonk conferences. He made certain he got invited. He wrote to them, not once, but twice, to make sure they invited him to the next conference. It was invitation only. It was sort of the main place to be if you were a mover and shaker. And people from all over the world who were ambassadors and other high-level journalists and so forth were attending, as well as a few heads of state. What made the Smileys different was that they tried to keep the discourse at the level of principle. They didn't get into specific examples. Because once you get into specific examples, you fight about the facts. They weren't interested in the facts. They were interested in the principles. And once you have the principles, then you start applying the facts to it. And they also made it very clear in their conferences that spiritual solutions were part of the solution. And also inclusiveness. 
They always had women and they always tried to have diverse voices. It's very easy to get people who agree with you. So in the beginning, they got the standard do-gooders, but he brought in the business community because they have a point of view as well. And it made things more practical because if you're only talking at high level principles, yes, nobody likes war, but practically, how do you get there without getting into, was this a good or bad treaty? How do you make a treaty? How do you enforce a treaty? When is force appropriate to enforce a treaty? These are the kinds of questions that they did, but they also understood that most issues are like peeling an onion and you get through one layer and then you have to go through the next layer and the next layer and the next layer. And so every year they had conferences on different themes. And the one that Abdul Bahab was involved in was the one on international arbitration, but they also had a Native American one and for some years one on African Americans and their plight. And every year they would take the same theme, but go deeper. What's changed? What do we do now? And let's talk about this openly in a civilized way. They also made it very difficult for people who wanted to monopolize to get control of the sessions. So they were very careful about how and who chaired the meetings. Abdul Baha singled them out. May 1912. All of the conference participants are gathered for the opening session. The attendees include a future prime minister, ambassadors, journalists, religious leaders, and businessmen. Abdu'l-Bahá is introduced by Nicholas Murray Butler, a future recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize. Abdu'l-Bahá begins by saying that, whenever we consider history, we find that civilization is progressing, but in this century, its progress cannot be compared with that of past centuries. This is the century of light and of bounty. In the past, the unity of patriotism, the unity of nations and religions was established. But in this century, the oneness of the world of humanity is established. Abdul Baha's focus is always on the oneness of humanity. He says that we cannot establish any kind of meaningful peace in the world before this oneness becomes an accepted principle. He describes to all those assembled that during the 19th century, when wars were raging throughout the world, his father Baha'u'llah inspired many to abandon prejudices and embrace love and closely associate with those they considered their enemies. The Washington Herald reports on the conference. Abdul Baha, leader of the Baha'i movement, attracted considerable attention as he delivered a message of goodwill to the audience. The leaders spoke on the oneness of the reality of humankind and created a profound impression upon his hearers. The majority in the crowd subscribes to the idea that the world just needs to expand the number of countries encompassed by a system of international arbitration. Amin Eheya. For Abdul Baha, however, the problem for peace lied primarily on moral causes and spiritual causes, not on diplomatic causes. In his talk to the, the Lake Mohon Conference on International Arbitration, as he did in many other talks, and as he would also do in many of his correspondence, he emphasized the need to free mankind from certain discourses that only promoted hate and which were against the idea of human equality. He, for instance, spoke against prejudices, religious prejudices, national prejudices. And he alerted the world that unless mankind is get rid from these types of discourses and from these different forms of prejudices, war would be inevitable. No matter how many institutions we would have and no matter what kind of global governance we would establish. But Abdul Baha goes beyond the elaboration of sophisticated institutional arrangements to establish peace and asserts firmly the moral basis upon which humanity must move ahead. He continues this theme in speaking about peace in many of his talks in the West. He says that war is not ultimately a result of insufficient international arrangements, but is rooted in false conceptions of the human being that lead to division and contention. These ideas are born out of a culture of inequality where racist and nationalistic ideas are on the rise and are pushing humanity towards a bloody future.
Abdul Baha describes to his audiences that every prejudice must be renounced if the world is to have peace. In Paris, he says that prejudice is a grave malady which, unless arrested, is capable of causing the destruction of the whole human race. Every ruinous war, with its terrible bloodshed and misery, has been caused by one or other of these prejudices. In a church in Brooklyn, Abdu'l-Bahá says that, As long as prejudices prevail, the world of humanity will not have rest. At this time, eugenics, the theory that there are superior and inferior races, enjoys significant endorsement from the scientific community and is enshrined in much of the law. In attendance at his talks are some of the leading Western exponents of eugenics. Abdu'l-Bahá rejects the very bases on which these models of thought are based. He describes race as a construct, and that humanity is, in fact, one race. He denies that nations are natural realities, referring to national divisions as imaginary lines and boundaries. Historian Mujan Momin. The other aspect of this vision was that it wasn't going to come about through uniformity. In other words, the idea was not to impose one particular culture on other cultures, which is the way that globalization is to a large extent occurring in the world today and why it's so much resented. But Abdul Baha's vision of globalization was one where the unity that was envisaged encompassed and indeed gloried in diversity. And he expressed this in his rhetoric. He, for example, compared the diversity of human beings and of human culture to the flowers in a garden or to the limbs of a body. In each case, the diversity increases the beauty and functioning of the whole. Peace for Abdu'l-Bahá is not simply an idea, but an inevitability that humanity is journeying towards. It is that same peace, he says, that has been foretold by the founders of all the great religions and cannot be established through human hand alone. At an address in Pittsburgh, he says, peace cannot be established by patriotic devotion and sacrifice, for nations differ widely and patriotism has limitations. Furthermore, it is evident that political power and diplomatic ability are not conducive to universal agreement for the interests of governments are varied and selfish. Nor will international harmony and reconciliation be an outcome of human opinions concentrated upon it. For opinions are faulty and intrinsically diverse. Universal peace is an impossibility through human and material agencies. It must be through spiritual power. If the moral precepts and foundations of divine civilization become united with the material advancement of man, there is no doubt that the happiness of the human world will be attained and that from every direction the glad tidings of peace upon earth will be announced. Religion, Abdu'l-Bahá says, is the spiritual source in which humanity can discover the principles and the motivation to establish peace. Amin Aheya he offered to the West a wholly new concept of religion in which religion is not just a set of rules or a set of dogmas, but religion is an agent that can educate mankind and can promote peace. And he mentioned this, for instance, in this talk, and he invited the audience to see religions as promoters of peace and love because they all share these common moral foundations. And they spoke on the need of getting rid from whatever is superficial and man-made in religions. During his travels, Abdu'l-Bahá addresses some of the most prestigious and established peace societies in Europe and North America. As well as his constant focus on the spiritual prerequisites of peace and his challenge to many of the prevalent beliefs of the time, what's striking is how frequently Abdu'l-Bahá warns the West about the dangers of a coming war if the global community does not change its approach to peace. I have been able to locate at least 17 instances in which he mentioned an upcoming war in Europe. The earliest of these instances was in early 1911, 
when he was in Egypt and gave an interview for a North American journalist, which is three years before the war broke. And the most explicit comments he made on the World War were made in Montreal in September 1912. He gave an interview for a local newspaper in Montreal and he went as far as saying that Canada would be involved in the war because of its relationship with the United Kingdom. He gave many details. He said also that Persia would not be involved in the war. And we have front page of that Montreal magazine. The title was Prophet of Peace, Alerts of an Upcoming War. This was in September 1912. That was for sure one of his goals in visiting the West. Once again, newspaper headlines pick up on Abdul Baha's warnings. Apostle of Peace here predicts an appalling war in the old world. Abdul Baha urges world peace. Persian peace apostle predicts war in Europe. Europe itself, Abdul Baha says in Paris in 1911, has become like one immense arsenal full of explosives and may God prevent its ignition. For should this happen, the whole world would be involved. Filmmaker Tim Perry. He spent a lot of time doing diplomacy, and often he would have meetings with ambassadors and delegates behind closed doors where even his scribes and people that were in his entourage weren't allowed to go there. And he really disdained war and the concept of war, and I think he knew what was coming. He even talked about it in some of the talks that he gave. And he never really would put down people or especially, you know, call them out by name, but he said the arms manufacturers, he would call them out by name. The idea of their contribution to the war effort was very disturbing to him. On the 28th of June, 1914, Archduke Franz Ferdinand is shot dead in Sarajevo, sparking the arsenal full of explosives to which Abdu'l-Bahá had referred. During the First World War, peace is at the forefront of the mind of Abdu'l-Bahá, and just after its conclusion, he pens a letter addressed to the Executive Committee of the Central Organization for a Durable Peace in The Hague. In it, Abdu'l-Bahá explains that peace will require a transformation in human consciousness and a commitment to fundamental spiritual principles, such as the abolition of all forms of prejudice, the harmony of science and religion, and the equality of women and men. In writing this letter, Abdu'l-Bahá is also conscious of the threat of yet another war. He is candid in his correspondence at the time about the likelihood of a second world war, despite the terror caused by the first, and the enormous progress that had been made in international governance with the establishment of the League of Nations. In 1919, he writes, Although the representatives of various governments are assembled in Paris in order to lay the foundations of universal peace and thus bestow rest and comfort upon the world of humanity, yet misunderstanding among some individuals is still predominant and self-interest still prevails. In such an atmosphere, universal peace will not be practicable, nay, rather, fresh difficulties will arise. Historian Mujan Momen. Abdul Baha saw this political process towards peace as exemplified by the League of Nations as being, while commendable, it was inevitably flawed because it was based on each country grabbing for itself the most power, the most advantage over other countries, and indeed effectively colonizing parts of the world under this process when the League of Nations set up these mandates for different parts of the Middle East, for example, and in Africa and in other places. So Abdul Baha understood the flaws in the setup because of this inherent inequalities that it cemented into place. And his constant contention was that 
lasting peace would not occur until there was these other prerequisites of peace in place, such as raising the social role of women, bringing about freedom from discrimination between races, improving education across the world so that there's universal education, eliminating the extremes of poverty and wealth, all of these social principles that he advocated. He said lasting peace could not occur until these things were in place. So all of this political movement towards peace was all well and good, and it was obviously better than war, but it was not going to be lasting peace unless these other things were in place. The next year, having observed that the world puts its faith in mere institutional arrangements and treaties to achieve peace, Abdu'l-Bahá writes, In the future, Another war, fiercer than the last, will assuredly break out. Verily of this, there is no doubt. It is interesting that after the First World War, when the League of Nations was being created, when again there was some optimism in the air about the future of mankind, again Abdul Baha would emphasize that this would be useless. And already in 1920, he would mention that it would be in the future a greater war than the one just finished. And this is not peace at all. And he was quite emphatic and sometimes quite explicit. There's a particular letter in which he very emphatically and very explicitly enumerated all the things that would lead mankind to the Second World War. From every aspect humankind hath sunken low. Loud are the piercing cries of fatherless children, loud the mother's anguished voices reaching to the skies. And the breeding ground of all these tragedies is prejudice. Prejudice of race and nation, of religion, of political opinion. And the root cause of prejudice is blind imitation of the past, imitation in religion in racial attitudes, in national bias in politics. So long as this aping of the past persisteth, just so long will the foundations of the social order be blown to the four winds. Just so long will humanity be continually exposed to direst peril. To remedy this condition, there must be universal peace. To bring this about, a supreme tribunal must be established, representative of all governments and peoples. Questions both national and international must be referred thereto, and all must carry out the decrees of this tribunal. Today, nothing short of these divine teachings can assure peace and tranquility to mankind. But for these teachings, this darkness shall never vanish. These chronic diseases shall never be healed. Nay, they shall grow fiercer from day to day. The Balkans will remain discontented. Its restlessness will increase. The vanquished powers will continue to agitate. They will resort to every measure that may rekindle the flame of war. Movements, newly born and worldwide in their range, will exert their utmost effort for the advancement of their designs. The movement of the left will acquire great importance. Its influence will spread. At this time, the German Workers' Party, I think, didn't exist. Something before that existed. And in Italy, the germs of what would be faces four or five years later were just starting. And he could already see this, you know, an alert on this. And then he goes and speak about the rise of the left, which is also very important to understand what happened in the Second World War and afterwards. He never spared any occasion to emphasize the importance of reading reality, not just from the political or material point of view, but also from the moral and spiritual point of view. To assess what is mankind's moral situation and spiritual situation, what is the level of hate in the world. And with this diagnosis, he would emphasize, it doesn't matter all these things we have. As far as there is hate as we have today, there will be war. There's no escape from it. And he averted this once and again in his correspondence, in his public talks, in his interviews with the press. 
but unfortunately nobody listened. Abdul Baha passes away some 18 years before the outbreak of the Second World War, the most destructive global conflict in history. Out of the ashes of the League of Nations, the United Nations Organization rises with a system of international economic institutions, as well as historic advances relating to human rights and international law. While the succeeding decades are overshadowed by the Cold War, the UN is the world's best example for a system of collective security. Those inspired by Abdul Baha's vision and commitment to peace are present during its founding conference in October 1945. Three years later, the Baha'i International Community is formed as an international non-governmental organization associated with the United Nations that continues its work for peace today. To mark the 75th anniversary of the United Nations in 2020, the Baha'i International Community releases a statement. It asserts that the needs of the 21st century will require a far greater level of global integration and cooperation than anything that has existed before. It calls for the strengthening and evolution of the consultative process of international dialogue and for world leaders to give priority to those elements that will benefit the whole of humankind. What is needed now is a radical change in the approach to solving the problems of the world, a process that conceives of the world as an organic whole and takes into consideration the essential need for spiritual and ethical advancement to be commensurate with scientific and technological progress. Thus do those inspired by Abdul Baha's crystal clear vision of the prerequisites for world peace continue today to walk in his footsteps by calling and working for a global unity founded on moral and spiritual principles. In the next podcast, we'll look at how Abdul Baha dedicated his life to serving others and inspired those around him to do the same. <laughs>